Let's talk about the architecture in Final Fantasy X. I recently did a playthrough, and I have some questions. How could the design of the city of Guadalajara have tipped you off a little bit about the relationship between its power and its people? Can you guess which building, through some analysis, expresses the struggle of the entire game itself? And is it possible that Final Fantasy X changed the way that you see the world entirely? Now, this is not a strategy or a walkthrough or a history, but a discussion about what architectural thinking can tell us about video games and vice versa. So. Hi, I'm Scav and I'm an architecture critic. Welcome to The Extra Office, a channel where I talk about architectural thinking and video games. Let's get started. Final Fantasy X was published and developed by Square and released in 2001 for PlayStation 2. It was one of the most commercially successful console RPG releases in history, with over 14 million PS2 sales all time. To understand or discuss the architecture in Final Fantasy X, we have to think about the eye of the observer and what cultures these architectures are trying to represent. From Bisayd, Dekilika, Luka, Guadalajara, Macalania, Holm, Bavel, Mount Gagazet, Xanarkand, these are all different cultures. This game can be thought of as cinema, which we watch through the eyes of a camera in the room. We are not a character, but we are a third-person view of a person and a party moving through space. This is typical of this genre, and of Final Fantasy in general, so let's understand that we are seen as an observer. We don't play as Titus or Yuna, but we play as a voyeur, and we project ourselves as being tasked with guiding the actions of a party towards success. Now this doesn't mean we aren't attached to the characters themselves. On the contrary, our detachment from this world is understood, and because we pilot the entire party, our self or personality traits start to show up inside of each character. For example, when Yuna reluctantly decides to marry Seymour for the good of the continent, I saw myself as a child agreeing to be the groom in a wedding planning game to the joy of my sister and her friends. These kinds of attachments are what made this game so memorable for me when I was in my teens. As you can see, I still have the original strategy guide that I used. Ooh, this thing's beat up. So let's keep this in mind. This game is about a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is a spiritual journey marked by walking. The path of the foot with each step is a step toward enlightenment. This game is about myth, legend, and cultural clashes between technology and belief systems. The player moves in a fully 3D environment, but from a fixed camera angle, which is again, like watching a film. Uh, another part of conditioning in a game is not just who we play as, but the HUD, heads-up display, and in this case, the heads-up display while you're walking is nothing but a small map in the corner, but those mini-maps rely on a player's sense of understanding perspective in relationship to plan because it, they're often, the camera angle can be disorienting, and so your knowledge of how to align your vision of a space with what its conceptual plan is, players can use their understanding of perspective matched to a plan view in order to figure out how to get to secret spaces. But the menu system itself is totally neutral in graphic format, which really to me makes like the idea that this is, a, is cinema even stronger because to access the menu system is to pause the game like you're pausing a movie and that the HUD or the, the fonts in the menu system take you totally out of the narrative space and into a strategy space. And the music is incredible. It's also doing the work of setting the tone uniquely in each village or city quite well. And that's something that Final Fantasy has always been really good at, matching a tune or a, a specific almost jingle or a song to each village or culture is a great way of enriching that environment. And we know this. What I love about the way that the game is organized spatially is that all the locations in the game are split into chunks of similar-ish size. So for example, the Mihen High Road is nine chunks, while Mount Gagazette is five. 
and space throughout any game defines our pace. And since all the chunks are about the same size with a fixed camera angle, these become scenes. These chunks are the basis for how Final Fantasy in general operates spatially. And this was probably due to like a processor limitation, but I think your ability to conceptualize the whole is only by experiencing directly each individual chunk as you're stepping. So it's a very part-based relationship. You're never really experiencing the full world. Your knowledge of the world is based on your movement, which so beautifully ties the idea of a pilgrimage into the mechanic of the game. Since the beginning of the game, we realized that we're in a lot of temporal flux. Time is changing a lot in the narrative. We could be in the past or the future. This is beautifully played out, not only through the architecture, but through fashion. Titus rocking this kind of future punk squire look, Lulu in full witch house, Riku and the Albed in general in full steampunk, and Waka is like this Pacific Islander chic. You get the picture. We can read this surreal difference in the game to a cultural shift in the Pacific and in Asia in general, where a lot of islands or rural areas are globalizing quickly. One could move from a simple fishing village to a cosmopolitan metropolis in just a matter of hours. Architecture is what ties the fashion of the characters and the worlds they come from and the cultures they come from all together. So let's look at some examples of these cultures and critique how they brought these differences to life. First, let's start with Bisaid. I, I love this bucolic island town. It has relaxing music and a small village, which is a sort of ordered series of tents. And I, I kind of love that the village buildings in this case aren't really buildings, but they're actually fabric structures, which express the temporality of the story that Titus is feeling. Titus just washed up on the shore of a village that appears to be really far back in technology technology, but actually he's a thousand years into the future. But the buildings express this temporality because they aren't even solid buildings. They're actually tents. And even the inside, you see that they're all made of fabric. So next, let's look at the major city of Lucca, which is the seat of cultural tradition and or cultural ritual, which transcends the thousand year history gap, which I love as an inclusion. This one cultural tradition, Blitzball, not religion, but sports. If that doesn't clue you in as to the overall attitude to the for the game, mm. now Luca is also home to the Sphere Theater, the most telling piece of architecture in the game. Here we start with this super impressive eye-level view of the structure as a player with this large duck-billed cantilever, the likes of which we wouldn't see built in the real world. And as we come to the entrance, we find this building has ornate decoration and mixes motifs of this contemporary structure, like this large cable buckle looking thing, with classical order and a colonnade. And finally, on the most interior of the building, we're faced with these fully classical motifs, bereft of contemporary elements. The inside looks like the United Nations, or a lecture hall, or an opera house. Spaces of democracy, yes, but also spaces of order, power, and hierarchy. The inside produces nothing radical as the outside promised. In doing so, the building expresses the conflict of the game itself. Remember, the game is about fighting organized religion's corruption and the suppression of technological advancement. Now, the architecture here internalizes and expresses this struggle. Even, you could say, a particularly Japanese struggle of classical hierarchies and the existing order of society clashing with cultural and technological advancement. We could take this one step further and say that while architecture always strives to create visions of possible futures, like we can see on the outside of the building, th this remains at its core an utterly normative plan, devaluing the impressive look of the exterior. So if a piece of architecture tries to create a truly different world, it must not just express something exciting to the world from the outside, but reorder the interior space in a way which changes or shifts our perception of one another and of the outside world. Now, as urban centers, most of the cities are organized as a main building representing the governing structure or the church, which is sometimes one and the same. 
with an open public space below flanked by small businesses and homes. Besaid, Kilika, Bevel, Gagazet, and Zanarkand all follow this pattern. However, Guadalcanal is organized a little differently in terms of the public and the relationship to power. There is this grand entry door to Seymour's house, but it is not open and it is not visible. This portrayal of the Guado city suggests a lot of trust in the leader who has all the power and a ton of privacy. Without the architecture expressing an openness to the public like all the other cities have, there is no embedded accountability between the power, Seymour, and the public, Guado City. And of course, in the end, we find out about a massive corruption going on inside of Seymour's palace. Now, a quick study of history will tell you that corruption can happen regardless of governmental architectural structure. But reading the architecture in this narrative can help us understand how space and its arrangement can assist in the narrative of a game. The architecture plays a part in conditioning the player. So come on, does architecture really influence the strategy of the way you play video games? Uh, yes. The architecture compels you to care about the story, and finding out what happens next in the story is what inspires you to hit pause and to reflect and to form a strategy to win the battle to keep the story going. So how could Final Fantasy X have changed the way that you see the world? Well, aside from all of its incredible lessons on beauty and love and friendship and sacrifice and destiny and religion, I think the most important aspect of this game was its acceptance of the spread of wild aesthetic differences. This game might have been ahead of its time for seeing the shift of globalization in the internet causing culture to sort of split from singular culture into a wild sea of aesthetic constituencies. The internet has really allowed those communities to flourish, and I think we can thank games like Final Fantasy X for preparing us for the onslaught and radically understand a dedication to accepting one another. Thanks for listening. Of course, please like, share, and subscribe to get uh, more videos like this. Comment down below with what game you think I should do next, and get into a Discord chat and add your voice to this discussion.